science plays a vital role for economic development and societal well-being. Understanding this, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia was established with a mission to be Malaysia's thought leader in all areas of science, technology and innovation. To realize its mission, ASM harnesses the nation's top scientific minds to chart the STI direction and facilitates the implementation of an innovation-led economy for the country. ASM's commitment lies firmly in fostering a culture of excellence in STI in Malaysia. ASM does this by providing independent, credible, relevant and timely STI input of national and international importance to the country. Our network of expertise comprises Malaysian scientists, engineers and technologists who specialize in various disciplines. The Academy assists in upgrading the nation's technological capabilities in the industrial sectors by producing high-quality publications such as peer-reviewed journals, monographs and books. In addition, ASM also provides input on current and future technology trends to be considered and taken up by the government in driving the nation's economy forward. To provide Malaysian scientists with the best opportunities and exposure, ASM actively extends its international networks and collaborations. It currently has a range of multilateral engagements with renowned scientific institutions worldwide. The Academy also champions the need to grow the right talent in STI by cultivating interests in science, technology, engineering and mathematics to the younger generation. In short, the Academy's ethos is broadly defined as Think Science, Celebrate Technology, Inspire Innovation.
science plays a vital role for economic development and societal well-being. Understanding this, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia was established with a mission to be Malaysia's thought leader in all areas of science, technology and innovation. To realize its mission, ASM harnesses the nation's top scientific minds to chart the STI direction and facilitates the implementation of an innovation-led economy for the country. ASM's commitment lies firmly in fostering a culture of excellence in STI in Malaysia. ASM does this by providing independent, credible, relevant and timely STI input of national and international importance to the country. Our network of expertise comprises Malaysian scientists, engineers and technologists who specialize in various disciplines. The Academy assists in upgrading the nation's technological capabilities in the industrial sectors by producing high-quality publications such as peer-reviewed journals, monographs and books. In addition, ASM also provides input on current and future technology trends to be considered and taken up by the government in driving the nation's economy forward. To provide Malaysian scientists with the best opportunities and exposure, ASM actively extends its international networks and collaborations. It currently has a range of multilateral engagements with renowned scientific institutions worldwide. The Academy also champions the need to grow the right talent in STI by cultivating interest in science, technology, engineering and mathematics to the younger generation. In short, the Academy's ethos is proudly defined as Think Science, Celebrate Technology, Inspire Innovation. We welcome all of you back to the International Conference on Tropical Sciences. We hope you had a good break. We will now move on to the first keynote lecture of the conference that will be given by Dr. Peter Dasak, the president of EcoHealth Alliance. Dr. Peter Dasak will talk about a strategy to predict and prevent viral pandemics under the track of Tropical Medicine of the Mahadev Science Award. Over to you, Dr. Peter Dasak. I first want to start off by saying thanks to um, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to speak in front of a, a Malaysian audience again, even though I can't be there in person. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about how we can try and predict and prevent pandemics. And there's a very good reason why we should be doing this. Obviously, we're in the middle of COVID-19, um, which is a, um, a significant pandemic. Um, but this isn't the first. We've seen a series of these over the past 100 years and a series of other emerging diseases, including in Southeast Asia, even in Malaysia with Nipah virus. Um, we've seen repeated outbreaks of SARS and other um, uh, coronaviral-like diseases that cause significant disruption to our economies and, and affect us. Um, 
the, the impact on the economy is quite incredible. As we see this over the last few decades, um, $30 billion or more um, impact of SARS outbreak in Southeast Asia and around the world because diseases like SARS and like COVID affect our ability to uh, rely on global connections for our economies. And that's very significant. In fact, when you see the impact of um, COVID, um, you, you'll start to see that this is a very significant, that big black um, circle coming in, probably in the tens of trillions of dollars of damages. So understanding what causes pandemics and trying to stop them has real potential for a healthier and happier future. Um, how are we going to do that? Well, I, I look at pandemics as a step-by-step -step process. Pandemics are rare events, but the diseases that cause them, that lead to them, are more common. They spill over from animals into people on a regular basis. And at the bottom of this schematic, you can see we've got wildlife and livestock interacting with each other and people in the middle of that mix. Viruses from wildlife emerging into livestock and into our cells in small outbreaks that every now and again cause larger significant spikes, the red spikes in the middle of that, of that schematic, and then rarely go on to travel in, in, um, in, in our globalized networks of travel and trade. So my belief is that to deal with pandemics, we need to go down to this bottom part of the figure here and look at our interactions with wildlife. Almost every pandemic has emerged from an animal origin, usually a virus. Um, so let's look at animal viruses and see which ones have potential to emerge and try and stop them. That's a disease X approach. What will the next unknown disease be and how can we stop it? So to do that, we've got to answer a lot of questions. And you know, th these are just a few of the things we need to find out. Where will these diseases come from? How many of them are there? Which wildlife should we be looking at? Um, where on the planet are emerging diseases most likely to begin? What causes them? Uh, and if we can predict the behaviours and the, the factors that drive them, can we then reduce the risk of pandemics? And how much will it cost? And how much will it save us? Because for these things to actually happen, we'll need to show that they have value. Um, so that's, that's a real difficult set of questions to look at. We've been able to answer some of them over the last few years. One of them, for instance, where on the planet are diseases most likely to emerge in? Um, we know from tracking all past emerging diseases, mapping them out globally, correcting for the places where people are, um, and, and analyzing the factors that are associated with those origins, we can see that two really important things drive pandemics. First of all, the interface between wildlife and people. Wildlife carry their own viruses, some of which can affect us if we give them the opportunity. So places where you've got high biodiversity, like Malaysia, for instance, and a, a growing human population are, have a potential for new emerging diseases, particularly where there's a change to the environment. And at the bottom of this, you can see change in population, change in pasture, deforestation, land use change, the wildlife trade, these are the factors that drive pandemic risk. So to understand emerging diseases, we have to understand where they come from. And for me, that journey to do that started in Malaysia. And back in 2001, I first came to Malaysia and I've been working with our group, Eco Health Alliance, in Malaysia, in the surrounding countries for the last 20 years. We originally wanted to try and understand where Nipah virus came from. This is a virus discovered by my very good colleague and friend, uh, Professor Lam and uh, Prof Chua, um, as a virus that came from bats and got into pigs in pig farms in Malaysia and then into people. And at the time was a very scary disease, still is, with a high fatality rate. Um, and seemingly no understanding of why this virus should emerge in Malaysia in that year and not somewhere else. One theory was climate change had driven this. You know, we know that the haze events every year drive bats to shift their migration patterns. So we looked at that and after a few years of tracking fruit bat migration patterns by attaching satellite 
um, transmitters to them and watching where they fly, we were able to show that climate change was not the cause of NEPA virus. In fact, it was something a lot more basic. Um, we looked at pig farm production and we found that pigs and fruit tree um, orchards uh, track in the same way. When pig farms were closed down during the NEPA virus outbreak, this red line on this graph, we saw that mango production also dropped. Fruits attract fruit bats. Fruit bats fly, these flying foxes fly to the pig farms and shed virus onto the pig styes. And this is what led to the emergence of Nipah. In fact, we could show after a lot of hard work with mathematical models of what happens to virus dynamics in pig farms, a very unique situation was set up where we had these very intensive uh, production farms and a repeated introduction of Nipah virus into the farms. And what happened was it, it sort of vaccinated the population as those that survived the original introduction of the virus continued to live in the farm. It created the conditions that allow the virus to persist in that population and repeatedly infect people. And what we saw was that maybe two years of humans getting sick from Nipah virus associated with pigs and eventually a, a large outbreak in Ipo and moving down into Singapore. So repeated spillover of diseases is bad, and especially where we have livestock mixing with people. And of course, that's exactly what we see with coronavirus. Uh, coronaviruses have emerged into the human population over and over again for the last few hundred years. SARS, SADS, MERS, um, COVID, these viruses represent the, the continuing emergence of this group into people. So it's no surprise that this new outbreak began, at least it appears to have begun, in a wildlife selling market in China, in Wuhan, the Huanan seafood market, which at the time when this disease broke out, we didn't know was selling live animals. But there is now good evidence that this market and many others were selling animals of the type that can carry coronaviruses, um, commonly in Wuhan, before the outbreak began. Trying to understand the origins of COVID is not easy, and it took us five years to really be able to say uh, definitively that Nipah virus emerged due to pig farm dynamics, not due to fruit bats or climate change. Um, it's going to take a while to really understand COVID origins, and there is a lot of debate publicly, but there is growing evidence. So we now know that there seems to be two spillover events from animals to people, at least the, the genomic data suggests that. That's the sort of thing you'd see from repeated exposure from animal farms, for instance. We know that the epidemiology in Wuhan points to those markets that sold livestock, sold wildlife at the beginning of the outbreak. And we know that there are other viruses in the wild in Southeast Asia, in bats, that are very similar to SARS. In fact, the closest now are from Laos. But we'll start to see more of those, I think. There's been a lot of talk about the furin cleavage site that allowed SARS-CoV-2 to become more virulent in people. Well, we're seeing evidence of furin cleavage sites or other um, similar uh, mutations around the spike proteins of many different coronaviruses in wildlife um, a, a, around the world. Um, for, for instance, in China, we found a, a rodent coronavirus in wildlife farms, hotels, and train stations with a, a polybasic cleavage site, similar to a furin cleavage site in the spike protein. So evidence is accumulating. The intelligence communities around the world have looked at this and are beginning to shift their opinion that the most likely scenario is this virus emerged in the human wildlife interface around wildlife farms and markets. In fact, we're just beginning now to see data coming from China on other coronaviruses found in the Huanan market, four different animal coronaviruses in the swabbing that was done after the outbreak began. So I think that the evidence will continue to accumulate and suggest that somewhere in South China, or maybe even in Southeast Asia, a bat virus got into the human population, maybe it got into wildlife farms, and then was shipped into those markets and led to this outbreak. So how can we 
deal with this and really prevent this happening again? Well, I think to do that, we need to see where these viruses are. This is Yunnan province, South China, where we think SARS coronavirus probably originated. This cave, for instance, we found every genetic element of the original SARS coronavirus uh, spike proteins in, in viruses in bats in one single cave. And we found hundreds of novel bat coronavirus sequences from China. Um, viruses related to SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, and viruses related to um, other animal um, origin diseases like swine acute diarrheal syndrome, a, a, a virus that killed 25,000 pigs in Guangdong a few years ago, and may be able to infect people. Um, we can predict the regions within Southeast Asia that are likely to be hotspots for virus diseases. So we know that from our hotspot map, this is where we should be looking um, the dark areas for the next spillover event. So you can see Malaysia is a hotspot. Borneo is even more of a hotspot. And that's driven by the incredible, beautiful diversity that's there. And um, so the wildlife themselves persist with these viruses. But when we move into wildlife areas, we drive the spillover of those viruses into people. So it's really no surprise that these new viruses, so-called banal group, are found in Laos. And, you know, let's just look at that region. The, the, the site where the closest relative of SARS-CoV-2 has now been discovered in bats is very close to the border with China. And we, we've got um, uh, anecdotal evidence that in COVID, when people get sick in northern Laos, some of them move across the border into China to seek treatment. So one of the things we're doing as, an, as research now is to look at human behavior during um, illness. Do people move into clinics in more urban areas and bring the disease with them? Do they move across borders with the potential of allowing viruses to get over borders? Or is it simply that bats fly across those borders and take the virus with them? We've been able to get to a very fine scale of prediction of risk in Southeast Asia for coronaviruses. Um, the hotspot map on the left is where the, the bats are that are known to carry um, SARS-related coronaviruses. And again, Malaysia is a hotspot. So we need to be looking for where those viruses are in our, in our um, wildlife populations, especially where people interact with them. And on the right, we've included the human population and the overlap between bats that carry SARS coronaviruses and people is quite incredible. It stretches all the way from South Asia, all the way down into, um, into uh, Indonesia and all the way up across into Northern China. Because we know how many people live in that region. And we also know quite a lot about how people make contact with wildlife, people who hunt them, who dig bat guano out of caves to use as fertilizer, who um, work in places like Gomantong Cave and collect um, uh, bird's nests for bird's nest soup. They're the ones who are making contact with bats. We also know from a small amount of studies um, that there are people out there who've been infected recently with SARS-related coronaviruses, bat viruses, prior to COVID and after SARS. And in fact, in one rural part of China, we, we found 3% of people roughly that, were in, that had antibodies to SARS-related coronaviruses. We know that those antibodies disappear after a couple of years. So from all of these data, we can begin to get an estimate of how many people in this region in Southeast Asia actually get infected every year from these uh, novel bat coronaviruses and that don't lead to a pandemic. These are the spillover events that never get noticed that probably lead to either mild or unnoticeable illness or even small outbreaks that don't get reported. When we do the calculation, we come up with a number of about 50,000 people as a median number, 400,000 as, as a mean in that region who are infected by bat SARS-related coronaviruses every single year. I mean, just think about that. Tens of thousands of people every year picking up new viruses that could lead to the next pandemic. How are we going to find out where they are and control that? 
So we've taken on that challenge and, and working with funding from NIH, we've set up a program called EID Search um, based in Malaysia, Singapore, um, Thailand, and the US. Um, this, this has been running now for a year, and I just want to talk a little bit about it. We're looking for the viruses in wildlife that have potential to emerge in people. So we're sampling bats, primates, rodents. Um, we're then working with communities that are in the region where these wildlife live. We're looking for serological evidence of spillover antibodies. And then we work with clinics where we look for a PCR evidence of people who come to clinic who are actually sick with these new wildlife viruses. We're developing new assays. We're finding new ways to understand the risk of these viruses in the lab. And then we try and work with governments to help reduce that risk. So after one year of work, we're already finding some interesting uh, results. These are from Thailand, and we're seeing new viruses here that are closely related to SARS-CoV-2, but have never been seen before in bat populations. We're finding viruses here in the red that are closely related to the pangolin viruses. These are bat origin coronaviruses, but look like the pangolin viruses. So there's a lot more to be discovered in that region. We class these as a high risk because they're known, uh, they're related to viruses with a known potential to infect people. We're finding viruses that infect a whole series of different bats in the wild. A, a virus that can move between one species and another is a higher risk to people. And we're also finding viruses that we don't yet know how, how significant they are. We've been able to do experiments in the lab. This is at Ralph Barrick's lab in, in North Carolina to show that the swine acute disease syndrome, coronavirus, is able to infect human cells, including airway epithelial cells. So that could spill over into people. Um, we don't know if it has real potential, but we're very interested in this group. We've actually discovered dozens of sequences of related viruses. We've been able to look at their relationships, um, which ones seem closer to the pig virus that has potential to infect us, and which ones are more distant. And we can map those out geographically so we know where to expect to see people who are getting sick from these viruses. We also can map where pigs are around the region. So just like Nipah virus, we've now got a coronavirus that can get into pigs and potentially people. So we can plot a hotspot map of where to expect that virus so we can do surveillance and get ready for it before it emerges. And that's really the key to prediction, finding out where these viruses are, where people who are intimately associated with wildlife live, and targeting our surveillance there. Because otherwise, there's too much to do and we can't afford to do it. So for the human side of this, we're beginning work this year in communities across Southeast Asia who are, have a very high connection to wildlife, including the Orang Asli in uh, Peninsular Malaysia, and other groups that hunt and eat wildlife. And what we do with the community is saying, how often do you make contact with wildlife and then taking samples and testing them? Now, we're unlikely to catch a virus actually infecting someone in the community. Um, there are some studies that did that, and this is one from Nathan Wolf's group a few years ago where he looked at hunters in Africa that were picking up simian foamy viruses. These viruses last a long time in the human body, so it has a higher potential to capture them. What we're going to use are serological assays because the antibodies survive longer, and it's therefore we find more people with evidence of prior infection. We're working with Lin Fa Wang at Duke NUS, who's got a really good assay that can distinguish every um, variant of SARS-CoV-2 and every clade of SARS-related coronaviruses. So when we find people in a community who are positive to COVID, we can determine which variant they had, and if they've got antibodies that are cross-reacting with other bat viruses, we'll be able to say, actually, it was a bat virus that they were infected with. It's a new potential risk. We're also working with Uniform Services University, who've developed assays that can pick up a whole range of viruses, every known feel of virus, every known Ebola virus related 
group, every known Nipah virus related virus. So that if there's a new strain, as we saw in Australia with Hendra virus, a new strain of Nipah virus out there, we'll be able to find evidence of that in people. But you know, this work is only as good as our will to actually prevent diseases. And I just wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, we've known for many years in Malaysia about Nipah virus, and the Malaysian government has done a, an incredible job of preventing that outbreak happening again. Uh, the pig farms have changed. You're not allowed to plant fruit trees right next to the pig styes. The very big um, in, intensive production farms are extremely well managed. The animals are tested regularly. The people are tested regularly. These are the sorts of things we're going to have to do to prevent outbreaks. And that's for disease we know. We're also going to have to do that for these disease X, these diseases we don't know, um, and, and work on ways to reduce risk. It costs money to do that. Changing the way we produce livestock and ship it around the world has an impact on our industries. Changing the way we do surveillance costs money. But this is money well spent. And I think one of my big lessons that I've learned over the past few years is that if you analyze the economics of, of um, emerging diseases, you see that they're incredibly damaging to our economic system. We estimate emerging zoonoses cost about a trillion dollars every single year to our global economy. It's a very high cost to pay. Yet strategies to prevent them are probably cost in the order of tens of billions of dollars. The sorts of strategies I'm talking about are better management of land use change. So if we're going to build a road through a pristine rainforest in Sabah, let's check first to see if that will bring people closer to wildlife that could lead to a disease outbreak because these outbreaks are so costly. And we know that the malaria, the zoonotic uh, malaria in Sabah um, is directly linked to um, land use change. As we change the environment, we drive that risk. We're also going to have to do something uh, carefully about the wildlife trade. Malaysia does a really good job of prosecuting and tracking down poachers of wildlife and wildlife traders, for instance, pangolins. And we've shown if you test the pangolins in Malaysia, they don't carry coronaviruses. It seems like those animals pick them up along the trade routes into China across Southeast Asia. So this is an inherently risky activity. And even the legal wildlife trade carries risks. So we need to do a better job of surveillance around it. The good news is the more we know about the behaviors that cause this, the better armed we are to prevent future pandemics. It gives us the power to do something about it. So I want to finish there and just thank some of the partners around the world that have worked with us for the past 20 years. Um, in China, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, the funders at NIAID and USAID, um, National Science Foundation, and many, many others. Uh, Duke NUS, Lin Fa Wang, and our partners, especially in Malaysia, where we've worked for 20 years now. And um, I really want to pay my due respects to the government agencies of Malaysia that do an incredible job, both in Peninsular Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak, um, in the wildlife departments at Pahilitan, um, and, and in the health departments and in the departments that look after forestry and tourism, because these are the um, industries that are affected most when diseases emerge. They're also the industries that can do most to prevent them. And Malaysia is taking the lead and showing the way forward in that. And I also want to thank, of course, um, my good friend, Ken Lam, who invited me to give this talk personally, and it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you all from across the world. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Peter Dasak, for that keynote lecture.